We've got a wonderful speaker this afternoon with some very interesting things to, to tell us. And I'm going to turn the uh, meeting over now to our colloquium chair, Jay Raykow. Jay? Thank you, Fred. And welcome to our latest colloquium. Uh, we have a <coughs> real treat today, as we always do. Um, we have Professor Gary Blasi, who's Professor Emeritus at UCLA, and a, a true expert on the subject of homelessness. Uh, he's served terms as president of the National Coalition for the Homeless, Homeless Healthcare Los Angeles, and the Los Angeles Coalition to End Hunger and Homelessness. He's long been recognized as an authority in his field and has conducted research on public and government responses to homelessness. Um, uh, by way of curiosity, as, as he told me before, yeah, he does have something in common with Kim Kardashian. <laughs> he is one of only about six people who became a lawyer without attending law school. He did what we call reading law, where you apprentice to a lawyer and, and can become a lawyer that way. It's very rare, but uh, uh, Professor Blasey and uh, Kim Kardashian have both taken advantage of this system. So someday she may be a law professor too. Um, so I'd like to turn it over. Uh, and by the way, our next colloquium will not be until September 19th, the third Thursday in September, at which we'll have uh, Professor Erwin Chemerinsky uh, giving uh, a speech on something that undoubtedly will be entertaining and timely. So with that, I'll turn it over to Professor Blasey. Let me start my timer because I am a lawyer and a professor, so somebody has to keep track of me. Um, I appreciate the invitation, and I'm glad to see all of you here, um, even though the topic we have is uh, a challenging one um, in many different ways. Um, so I will um, uh, end the suspense and tell you the answer to the question, um, and I won't be done. Um, the answer to the question is yes, of course we can, uh, if we do a number of things. And none of those things are the most difficult challenges any city's ever face, faced. But we do have to address them. Is that better? Um, it is a big problem. These are the 10 largest urban areas in the country. New York City is on the left. Los Angeles is next. You can see we're not the most, we don't have the most homeless people in America. But if you compare the uh, blue part of the bar uh, to the orange part, the orange part are the people who are unsheltered, meaning that they are literally on the streets or wherever they are. They're not in organized shelters. Um, New York City shelters 95% of its homeless people. Los Angeles shelters 25%. And um, you can see the distribution across, across the way. Um, Los Angeles accounts for more unsheltered homeless people than the next seven uh, cities combined. Um, these numbers are from what's called a point in time count. It's done every January. We just finished having one this January. The results will be announced on January 31st. Um, it's important to note that um, this is just at one time, but being homeless is a process. It occurs over time. It's not just a one-time thing. Um, most people who are homeless uh, haven't been homeless for a, a huge period of time. Only a quarter have been homeless for a year or more. And in L.A. County, about 120,000 people experience homelessness over the course of a year. Each month, about 10,000 people become homeless. 9,000 of those 10,000 will resolve their problem, their housing problem, without much help uh, by, by whatever means. Only about 1,000 of them will enter the longer-term homeless population. Um, people always want to know, and there are always questions about 
who are we talking about and why are they here? Um, these myths uh, that I'm going to talk about have been around since I began working on this issue in um, 1983. Uh, do people come to LA for the weather or for uh, the great way in which homeless people are treated here? The answer is no. Our homeless folks are our homeless people from California and Los Angeles. 80% are from Southern California. 65 have been in this area for more than 20 years. And within Southern California, most people are still in the communities within just a few miles of where they were last housed for lots of reasons. It makes sense for people to stay uh, in the areas that they know. Um, the other most common question is, but aren't they all mentally ill or, or addicts? And the answer is no, but those populations are overrepresented. Uh, about half of the people on the street, and this has been the case for 30 years, have some combination of an addiction, mental health, or both, uh, both being the most common situation. They are overrepresented in the one time count because they're more likely to be counted. But as I say, among people who are homeless over a period of time, they're a fairly tiny minority. Um, another way uh, that people sort of try to make sense of this and explain it to themselves is that homeless people choose to be homeless. Um, in fact, among the leading causes, precipitating causes of homelessness are the loss of a job or income, family conflict or domestic violence, or eviction. And over the last 35 years, I have worked directly with probably on the order of a thousand uh, homeless people. I've only met three uh, who wanted uh, to be there. Uh, and those three had significant mental health issues. Um, the county of Los Angeles actually in 2007 did a, an experiment to see whether people wanted to be on the street. Um, they decided uh, that they would identify the 50 people on Skid Row most likely to die if they were not housed, <clears throat> and then move them into housing. And they identified those people by interviewing people at 3 o'clock in the morning um, on Skid Row. I was with uh, one of the interview teams, and person after person was told, we are um, looking into uh, a housing program. Would you mind talking to us? 80% of the people we approached talked to us at 3 o'clock in the morning, which was fairly remarkable. And their uniform response was, no, uh, I'm not interested in that. I'm not interested in, in like, I've been in all these missions down here. I've been in all the, all the shelters, and where I am now is better than that. And then uh, the people doing the interviews from the county said, well, we're not talking about that. We're talking about housing, which would mean a room, a key, a door you can close, and within that room you can do whatever you want as long as you don't uh, violate anybody else's rights. And then uh, after all those people had been interviewed and they tallied up and, and identified those people most at risk, uh, they spent a lot of resources finding those people again. And they made this offer. Uh, we'll uh, provide that room that we talked to you about. And um, 50 out of 50 said yes. And uh, they were moved into, uh, into uh, supportive housing, meaning housing with uh, supports to be able to stay there. Um, and 95% um, of them were there a year later. Uh, and many of them have now uh, gotten stabilized and moved on to a more ordinary situation. The uh, one thing that's not talked about nearly as much as it, as it should be is the degree to which the homeless problem is a problem that depends on race. If you just look at the raw statistics in Los Angeles, if all I know about you is that you're white, I can say that your odds of being homeless are 401 in 493. If you're a non-white Latino, that's 1 in 267. But if you're black, it's 1 in 40 meaning that African-American black people are uh, 12 and a half times more likely than whites to be homeless in LA, and almost seven times as likely uh, as Latinos. The explanations we don't have time to talk about, but it's basically compounding disadvantage upon disadvantage. Um, 
And one thing that's surprising, actually, is how few Latinos there are given the poverty distribution in, in, um, in L.A. Most really poor people uh, in L.A. are Latino and not black. But, uh, and there's a lot of uh, homeless Latinos, but not as many as you would expect. And this is largely explained, people think, because of the social capital, the connections, the ways in which patterns of migration mean that people have networks of, of support that many uh, white and black people do not have. So those are the people who are on the street and why. Um, it's important to understand the dynamics of this. We're not talking about dealing with the folks who are out there tonight. We're talking about uh, hopefully ending the situation. And in order to do that, we have to deal with the inflow of people to the streets. Um, there are a huge number of people in L.A. who are on the precipice of homelessness. I talked about the 100,000 people a year who become homeless. Um, we have massive inequality, more than any other uh, community in, uh, in the country. In L.A. County, there are 600,000 people who live in households that spend more than 90 percent of their cash income on rent. Um, so it's not hard to see how you could um, have a problem that would mean you'd miss a rent payment. Um, in contrast, um, in the real estate section of the, of the Times uh, a few weeks ago, I, I saw an ad from one broker uh, who had six houses in LA, each priced over $150 million. So we have extremes on both ends. But for poor people, it's a situation that the European social scientists talk about in terms of precarity. Um, we don't use that noun enough uh, to explain this, and, but it's, it really zeroes in. First of all, you have a huge number of people in this country who have zero cushion, zero assets. In fact, they have negative assets. And over the past decades, actually, but especially in the last year, years, um, Incomes have been flat, uh, and they've also been unstable at the bottom. And um, the safety net, uh, such as it uh, is or was, has gotten much worse. Um, when I began this work, I did a lot of work on the general relief program, which is the welfare program of last resort. It's what you get if you're not entitled to anything else. Uh, and the county is responsible to keep you from dying of poverty, basically, by giving you so-called general relief. 1984, when I started, that grant amount was $228 a month. That was enough to buy a, a room if you spent all of it for one week in Skid I mean, for one month in Skid Row. Um, in 2019, when a one-room apartment goes for $2,000, uh, um, that amount is $221. It's actually gone down since 1984. 60% um, of those 80,000 people uh, are homeless, many of them when they uh, apply, and many of them who become homeless over the period of time. That's not shocking to anyone. It's just common sense and arithmetic. But that's, uh, those are consequences of the decisions of the Board of Supervisors of the county uh, enabled by the state legislature. I want to talk to you about what we have done so far over the period of time that this has existed. And I should say that I started working on this before we used the, before the term homeless was applied to people who were just poor. It was only applied to victims of natural disaster when I started, uh, at least on the West Coast. On the East Coast, they had begun in New York and Washington to talk about homelessness as the kind of visible poverty that it became. Um, and when that uh, situation first arose, we did think about this as a shelter crisis um, because people were coming to us saying, I'm out, I'm sleeping outdoors, is there like some emergency shelter I could go to? We quickly discovered there were very few and they were all full. And, but nevertheless, we sort of conceived of the answer to this problem as really increasing the amount of shelter available. Because if you have a lot of homeless people because of an earthquake or a hurricane, what do you do? You do what FEMA does. You bring in, you bring in shelters. Um, the problem was we did that, and those shelters filled up immediately. Uh, and then we said, well, yeah, people have to have somewhere where to go. We need something called transitional housing until these people can become ready, quote unquote, for housing. We did that. All the transitional housing filled up. 
And then we said, well, people need housing. Yeah, and that's the problem we still have. We never really addressed that problem, in part because we started with a misunderstanding of what the problem was. Um, the responses have shifted over time a bit. I would say phase two, beginning in 2007. This took us a lot longer than New York and people on the East Coast. But we began to focus especially our resources on chronically homeless, long-term homeless folks who typically have uh, significant disabilities and very poor health. And um, in addition to being the people most likely to die on the streets, which was the criteria we used with Project 50, these are also people who cost the taxpayers, especially the healthcare system, a lot of money. And it turns out to be uh, cost effective. In fact, their healthcare utilization costs go down by two thirds once they get into housing. Housing is really bad for your health. I mean, homelessness is really bad for your health. Housing is the cure. I hope they'll fix that on the tape. Um, and we had a significant amount of success with that. Uh, that, in fact, became the national policy under both uh, Bush and, and then Obama. And there's a huge amount of evidence that it works, that if you, uh, particularly if you offer people housing, under what's called housing first, and then deliver the services that they need where they can get them, that they will stay housed. Uh, and the, the most typical rate in any well-run program is between 90 and 95 percent will stay housed a year. And um, many of those people will move on to more ordinary situations. And over two years, it's about 80 percent. And the money saved is more than enough to pay for all of the costs on those. And that leads actually to the most successful housing program in Los Angeles is not run by the housing department or any of the people you would think. It's run by the Los Angeles County Health Department. And they decided that nobody else was doing it. They would start using their own budget to house people. They now house more than 5,000 patients of the county health care system. And it's all paid for by what would they would otherwise be spending to see those people in emergency rooms and so on. So uh, for this population, it's really a no-brainer, but it took us a long time in L.A. Uh, to discover uh, that no-brainer. Um, in um, more recent times, there's been a little more focus on, um, A, getting resources that we need. I'll talk about that in a minute. But also more focus on reducing the inflow of people to the streets, not the, just the long-term homeless, but recognizing that once people become homeless, if they're homeless for a long period of time, they're going to become chronically homeless. They're going to develop those disabilities, including those mental disabilities. It's really bad for your mental health to be on the street and constantly under stress. So uh, if you require people to become chronically homeless before you help them, not only will they be miserable for the years that it takes to become chronically homeless, but um, it'll be much more difficult to help them uh, and more expensive when they get there. So if we can intervene, uh, provide assistance before people get to that state, that's a good thing to do. Uh, and that's kind of where we are now uh, with the programs that are, are now being uh, funded and implemented with varying degrees of success. Where we're not quite, which is where I think we need to go, is we actually need to sort of revisit our knowledge base for what it is that we're doing. Um, and for that, uh, for a change, we need to listen to homeless people when they say, here's what I need. I never heard any homeless client tell me uh, what I'm looking for is a, sh is a cot and a shelter. They all wanted the same things I wanted or anybody else that I knew wanted, and we sort of superimposed what we could give them for what they needed. Um, the other thing we have now we didn't have then is we have an enormous amount of data, big, de big data, they call it. Uh, that data is, can be quite useful for identifying people who are at high risk of becoming long-term homeless and uh, providing those people with uh, additional resources. And then finally, we really have to get a handle on rent inflation, and there's some efforts now in the legislature to do that. But um, the 
price of a one-room apartment, which is what's relevant to most homeless uh, people, because most people are single or, or couples, the average number of people in a tent in LA is 1.5 people, so one room is what is what they need. The price of that has gone up 55% uh, in five years, uh, and that is. Four or five years ago, full-time minimum wage, if you spent all of it on housing, uh, you could uh, get an apartment at the market rate. Today, that's not true. We do have uh, new resources, as you probably know, uh, to do something about this. Uh, in 2016, city voters authorized $1.2 billion in bonds. Uh, that was to be used ostensibly to enable the construction of 10,000 units of that permanent supportive housing I was talking about. Um, getting the money was easy. That passed with a, uh, a vote of more than 75 percent, astounding, uh, or a tax increase approved by 75 percent. But the delivery on that promise is, uh, is a little behind. As of today, they have completed zero units. And uh, in the pipeline for 2020, there are about 409 expected to be completed. So it's pretty clear we're not going to build our way out of, uh, out of this problem, certainly not at the rate that we're able to do it with the, the uh, system that we have for doing that. The county, uh, in the next election, county voters approved a half-cent sales tax increase that was not to go to housing but to services uh, to help people get out of homelessness or to, or to stay out of homelessness if they're just poor. And that's generated a lot of resources. The budget just approved by the Board of Supervisors uh, Tuesday for this year out of that fund is $460 million, half a billion dollars almost. And what's happened with that so far is that there's been a tremendous amount of action, lots of people hired, a lot of people doing things, a lot of outreach workers talking to people. Um, but um, the problem is it hasn't been done in a very strategic way or an accountable way uh, or a responsible way yet. Um, for example, all those outreach workers are only able to help a tiny fraction of the people that they encounter. So they collect data from them, but then they have nothing to offer them. Um, but meanwhile, that interchange costs money, and it costs the time of that person, and it, and it costs in the trust of that person to trust the system, so to speak. Um, so, but. Um, we have a massive accountability system. If you go or if you search for um, the dashboard or the quarterly reports on the so-called homeless initiative, you'll see there are all kinds of charts and graphs. But if you dig a little deeper, you'll see that the accountability is a little thin. So for example, they talk about how many people have been placed into, into housing. They don't tell you how many people fell out of that housing. Uh, and in fact, they don't even have a way of knowing that unless those people come back to them and ask them for something else. Um, and there's lots of reasons they wouldn't do that. And they talk about people being connected to services, but being connected to services might just be referring someone to a place that they, they and virtually everybody on the streets already knows about. So uh, we need uh, a, a better run, better managed, more accountable, more responsible system, but the money uh, is there, and that money will continue to flow at that rate as long as the economy survives. Um, so what, what, what should we do? Um, well, we have to do a lot of things at once. One is right now there's a huge shortage of shelter if there are 40,000 people on the street unsheltered. And um, that has to be done on, on in it, but in addition to that, it can't just be done by any possible means. That shelter that's provided has to be better than the alternative, uh, unless you're going to use the police to force people into shelters, um, which has never been shown to, to be effective. Um, you can tell whether it's better if you just try to put yourself in the shoes of that person. If you have to give up everything you own that doesn't fit in one cubic feet, which is what you have to do in a lot of the shelter programs, then you're not going to want to go. You know, there's things you want that don't fit. Uh, if you have to give up your dog or your cat, maybe the only thing that loves you in the world, you're not going to go. Um, if you have to sever your relationship with um, and split up and go in different directions from an intimate partner or just a good friend, 
I wouldn't go. I'd rather be in, a, in an encampment with that friend and the, and the people around. So the, the shelters have to be a little more humane and a little more sensitive to what people actually need, and that, as I say, you could learn by talking to them. Um, and then we've got to do something uh, to get people into housing as quickly as possible. For people with disabilities, that means that's kind of supportive housing. Um, and um, we're doing better at that, but not on the scale that we need. For recently homeless people, uh, and this is more effective, uh, they we're doing what's called rapid rehousing, which is to get somebody recently evicted just get them what they need to get back on their feet and to get back into the housing market, assuming that they have some income to be able to do that. But we have to identify and help those people uh, who have a chance at avoiding homelessness. And then ultimately, there's no solution to homelessness unless a, a lot of housing becomes available for free, which has never happened in America, uh, unless we do something about income. Uh, and that would include both uh, getting people connected to jobs, uh, better jobs than, than we're able to do now, and doing something about the, the income for those people who are not employable. Um, looking at the larger picture, if we're going to make progress, we have to increase the housing production rates. We need to stop thinking that we're going to build everything just like we've been building it for 100 years with uh, sticks and nails and doing it as if we were still a suburban area. We have to think more about um, more housing density where people can survive without a car. And we have a lot of, lot of land tied up in backyards, and we should allow uh, homeowners to, and we're doing, making progress in this area, to have um, auxiliary dwelling units. Um, but mostly, at least in the medium term, we're going to have to rely on the housing we have. And the only way we can keep that affordable is to control the price. Now, I'm not saying that the price should be frozen, but those landlords who have been able to increase their profit margins by 55 percent over five years, they could have increased them equivalent to the national average and still not gone bankrupt. Um, we have to do things about um, Inter getting into that, that market and leasing floors of buildings as opposed to trying to build that number of apartments. Uh, we have to make it easier for people to share housing. Uh, and we have to defend the low-cost housing we have. Um, people without lawyers lose very close to 100 percent of the eviction cases, even when they have, have a defense to those cases. So there's now a proposal to provide lawyers uh, for everybody in an eviction uh, who has um, a reasonable case within a certain geographic area. That's a good idea. And as I say before, we have to deal with the incomes we don't have uh, if we're going to sustain the situation. Um, other ways of slowing the inflow. We have to focus on these high-risk transitions. For example, people being discharged from hospitals with no uh, real plan for what they're going to do. Uh, people getting kicked out of the county jail at 4 o'clock in the morning without their medication. Um, people uh, coming out of the parole system. 40% of parolees arrive in downtown LA, uh, about a mile from Skid Row, with about 100 bucks in their pocket, and, um, and an appointment with a parole officer. That's it surprise that a lot of them don't, uh, don't, don't make it. Um, and then finally, we have to, to uh, this might be finally, um, we have to use the capacity that we have to understand what people need and who can be helped with what. And we can do that by asking them, but we can also use this big data I was talking about through something called predictive analytics. And some colleagues of mine have recently done that and have been able to identify people who lose their jobs who are most likely to become long-term homeless and to do that with about 80 percent accuracy, uh, which is fairly remarkable. So and they're now meeting with a, a bunch of uh, people, including the employment sector and, and the, the labor sector, to um, talk about how we can use that, identify those people, and then uh, help them um, with whatever it is that the, the individuals need to avoid homelessness. If we can do that, we have a chance. And um, this is just the, the last thought. 
it's not clear to me that this kind of industrial process that we've developed, where you have outreach workers doing this and housing people doing that and, and all that, um, is ever going to work. Um, because there's really no accountability for results. If somebody can go through that whole system, see seven people, end up back on the street, and uh, nobody even knows that happened, and certainly nobody gets blamed for it. Um, so think about what you would want if you uh, became homeless. I think you'd want what I would want, which is a friend, uh, somebody who could uh, sort of get me through the, the, the crisis. Uh, that friend would have to have some access to resources. And um, that would be the kind of model that a handful of places follow, where uh, a caseload is assigned to a team of people at the beginning, and they're responsible for what happens to that person. And they do whatever is required, whether that's searching for an apartment, driving the person to an apartment, sitting with them in their social security disability interview, and so on. Those systems work because the people like, actually know each other and uh, because if they fail, that failure gets matched uh, to the person who failed. And then lastly, as I said before, I think the, the, every mistake in policy that's ever been made, including by me, has been made because people didn't listen closely enough to what homeless people themselves had to say. They actually, they're the consumers, if you will, of this system that we have. In any other world, you ask consumers um, what, what they need or what would, what would work for them. We just have to do that. Um, and there's just lots and lots of um, evidence that that's the case. And, and we have to do that, um, for example, when we're clearing away apartments as opposed, I mean, encampments, not apartments. Um, we have to ask people, what do they need? to uh, avoid just moving to another encampment. Uh, questions? Start here. Uh, so what are the um, agencies, city or county, that are dealing with this? And uh, What are the agencies? Agencies, or who's in charge? Well, that's a really good question. There are three uh, big um, buckets of, uh, of folks. Uh, there's the city of Los Angeles through its um, uh, normal system that deals with everything else, uh, the city council, the mayor, and uh, they have a lot of meetings you can attend. I don't recommend it. Um, but. Um, there's really nobody who's responsible for the whole thing. Ostensibly, the mayor is responsible, uh, and, but the city council people, for example, um, they can't even, most of them, come up with a suggestion for where a shelter could be in their whole district, not one. I think only three, three or four council people out of 15 uh, have done that. So that, that's the city. Um, so you can't really say anybody's in charge there. On the county side, uh, the county's better organized. There is now uh, a homeless initiative uh, that sort of oversees um, all of this work. Each of the five supervisors has a homeless deputy. They meet weekly. Uh, and within each of the bureaucracies, whether that's the health department, welfare department, and so on, there are people uh, tasked with this. Um, but it's a huge problem, and it's a huge county. And remember, the county doesn't just deal with the city of Los Angeles. The biggest growth in homelessness actually has been out in the Antelope Valley. Um, so, um, and then there's a third agency called LASA, the Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority, created after a lawsuit I was involved in uh, back in the 80s. Uh, and it's uh, supposed to be a joint effort of the city and the county, but this, there's not much joint about it. Uh, it mostly gets some money uh, from this, this, these new pots, but otherwise it's basically just distributing the money that we, that the county and the city get from the federal government or the state government. So I mean, that, that is a big issue, the, the capacity of our local governmental system to actually accomplish uh, any, any significant progress in a complicated problem like this. Uh, we're not really up to that task. And people are not, as I say, not being held accountable um, for, for the results. 
Can you say more about um, the NIMBY response and what we can do to help? Well, there is a not nearly as large uh, group uh, called uh, YEMBYs. This says yes in my backyard. So uh, if the YEMBYs organized as well as the NIMBYs organized, then um, things would happen. The problem, I mean, there are two things about that. One is that sometimes these projects are on a scale uh, and, a, and a design that actually isn't very good for anybody, either the neighbors or the people there. So uh, we need to have more smaller scale uh, places for people, and um, and a lot of it c can just be, you know, re renting out spaces uh, in existing existing housing. Um, so there's some reason for people to to be concerned about these things, although it's mostly driven by by things that are not really concerns. I mean, there's not really an issue about violence or any of that sort of thing. But you know, in terms of the attractiveness of your neighborhood, yeah, it might go down a little bit if you had some more poor people in it. Um, but, um, and I think probably we need to set some limits on the ability of people to challenge um, basically anything that involves poor people or homeless people, or at least put some time limits on it, because right now lawyers can stall, and I train lawyers for many years, can stall things for a long time, and we don't have a long time. I don't see why not. I mean, I think it probably does require a significant amount of training, and there are cases that would be difficult for someone without an extensive background to handle. But there's certainly a lot of a lot of folks who are, uh, particularly among newly homeless people, who are just having um, a contact with someone who's sort oh, of connected to, you know, oh, know, how to find resources and that sort of thing, and with some training. I think I think that could happen, and. Um, for even the, the, I'm on the board of directors of a nonprofit called Housing Works that specializes in working with people with the most severe problems. And the system I described is the one that they use. They have a team of two responsible for 40 or 50 people, and they do whatever is required. Uh, and they're highly trained and experienced, and they can work with people who, you know, are, are really challenging to work with. Um, so, yeah, I think you could have um, a cadre of people who could deal with some of the less challenging folks, because people do just need, need, need a contact. That's a good idea. You mentioned you mentioned uh, the sources of some of these homeless individuals. For instance, the public safety prison system. They seem to find a lot of money to pay guards, but they don't seem to have much money to uh, adapt their release to the community, number one. Number two, the hospitals. There's certainly a lot of money in public medicine, not as much as maybe they'd like it, but there's still plenty of money there. And finally, there's folks with money in the VA system, and that constitutes three sources of significant number of people that get out on the street. Uh, is there some way that we can coerce the legislatures of various levels to pass some of that money on? Well, in terms of the, the hospitals, um, if the hospitals had some responsibility for what happens to people who pass through their emergency rooms, I don't know whether how feasible this would be, then they would develop the same self-interest that the county has in not dumping people on the street, because they'll, they'll show back up if, at that hospital. 
maybe that should be a requirement if you know, that you're that if uh, they have a health crisis and you've put them on the street they come back to your hospital not to the county hospital um, and I think they would quickly see the light in uh, in not doing the, the sort of patient dumping that still unfortunately occurs but also maybe do something more proactive and I think some big organizations like like Kaiser have started to, to do something like that. The, uh, the prison system, you know, has been largely dominated by the prison guards union for years and years and years. And um, there's no, there's virtually nothing like that kind of political power on this side because the people who are concerned are not as organized as the prison guards um, union. But um, it is obviously, uh, from anybody's point of view, uh, bad to basically be creating recidivism knowingly uh, so that you can get some of those prisoners back or encouraging um, law enforcement activity that sends people into, into state prison uh, when people don't belong there. I, don't, I, I could tell stories about how LAPD decided that some drugs possession cases would become possession for sale cases so that they could send people to state prison for two years as opposed to county jail where they'd be there for two days. Um, so um, yeah, I, I think there are things that could be done. It'll vary from uh, one of those institutions to the other, but um, doing something about those transitions is, is really critical. Hi, <clears throat> excuse me. I was living in Pasadena and uh, while I was there, um, my rent was raised consistently every three months um, and that happened consecutively six times in a row. Um, <clears throat> I could afford it, but my neighbors couldn't. It was an apartment complex. A politician came to my door and um, I said, is Pasadena considering rent control because many of my neighbors are getting priced out of you know standard one bedroom apartments and his response was no 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 that's not what we need we don't need rent control we definitely need just to incentivize building and just build more and um, I wanted to know how you would answer that question because I feel like I hear that a lot from people oh we just need to to build more and um, but I don't see um, apartments becoming available that are anywhere near the for affordable for my neighbors. <laughs> well, the apartments that are, that are being built, um, and there's a lot of them, as you can tell, driving around anywhere, um, are being built uh, to price around $4,000. Uh, not even the $2,000 that a one-room apartment um, now costs. Nobody's building buildings that have, except Nonprofits that are building supportive housing. Nobody's building buildings that just have one room. The market by itself is never going to do anything uh, that's helpful unless you're willing to wait 60 years for those uh, places to become dilapidated enough uh, that they will be less expensive. So um, uh, this is not, you can work with a market, uh, you can use market incentives, but to leave it to the market guarantees things will get worse. Uh, question. Um, just to scope this out, if you were put in charge of fixing this problem, what size budget are you talking about? How much would it cost? And how would you get it paid for? Well, I, w I would start with what uh, we're already going to have this year and see what we can do with basically almost $2 billion that's going to be coming from the state and local sources. And um, uh, basically the return on that investment depends, as it does in everything, on what you do. I would certainly not pour it all into new construction. As I say, you cannot build your way out of this. The city of Los Angeles is now funding one-room apartments at $600,000 construction costs uh, or, or uh, uh, turnkey uh, costs. That's just not 
feasible. You've got to work with the housing stock we have and keep people uh, in that housing, however crummy that housing may be. It's better than their alternatives. Um, and you've also, I think, got to develop some incentives, just like we've done for everything else, for clean air, for, for traffic, and so on, that will, that will have people respond, in a, in, including developers and landlords, in a more positive way. Make it um, easier for people to build uh, smaller unit housing. Um, change some of the building codes that assume, a, you know, a parent and two kids when that's not what we're talking about here. Uh, we're talking more like dormitory kind of situations, um, or at least smaller units. And um, there's a, a lot of things we could do to make it easier. But right now, like nothing like that uh, is happening. There's also a lot of money, and the question uh, about where where I would get the money. Um, San Francisco passed um, 20 plus years ago something called a commercial development linkage fee, meaning that every time a skyscraper got built in San Francisco, the um, developer had to pay a certain m amount per square foot uh, in order to offset some of the housing demand that that building would, would cause. Um, Los Angeles waited 18 years before it did that. And when it did that, in San Francisco, that per square foot price is about $21 a square foot. In Los Angeles, the, the fee on those, all those construction cranes that you see is $5 a square foot. And that $5 is exactly the same amount that Mayor Bradley almost got passed in, um, in the early 90s. So, uh, and why is that? Well, the, the staff recommended a much larger linkage fee. But by the time the lobbyists and the city council got done with it, it was, it was five bucks. And so, you know, that would have been a significant pot of money. So, you know, I, I would get the resources where the money is if there, you know, is a significant amount of activity uh, and it could uh, take a certain amount of the profits and contribute to the community that it's, that it's uh, trying to exist in. Um, and it's legal to do that, which is another problem. I mean, there are obviously things about Prop 13 and so on that could be changed that would free up a lot of money. Those six um, $150 million houses, some of those, the, their property taxes um, might not, um, if they're old, older houses, might not change at all because they're not actually there's no, no change in title. The property is owned by a corporation, and they're just selling controlling stock in the corporation. So if that happens, then you don't get reassessed. So there's just a lot of loopholes um, that have been, you know, people with influence know how to create loopholes. And they're the same people that know how to close them, but they usually don't work for, for free or for poor people. Is the federal government um, facing the problem or doing anything about the problem of homelessness? Um, no. <laughs> um, not, to, not to any degree. I mean, it's been, I mean, the, the federal government got out of the business of, of producing a significant amount of, of housing um, decades ago through Democrat, Republican, uh, whatever. Instead, they came up with this idea of tax increment, or I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, tax, uh, tax credit financing, which means that they would give tax breaks to rich people in exchange for some of that money being used to go to housing. So it was the kind of, it was the kind of program that benefited rich people and poor people got a little bit of it. So those, you know, it's easy to get, get those kind of things through. Something that just benefits poor people, man, good luck with that until there's a significant change in Washington. Uh, professor, uh, could yes. you, you commented on the ethnic breakdown. Uh, what about the breakdown in terms of ages? The homeless population is aging. Um, it's aging about... Uh, eight months for every year that goes by. When I started, the median age was in the low 30s. Now it's in the 50s. And the fastest growing population in the homeless population are, are older people. And, um, you know, there's, there's a, a lot of, um, of those precariously 
housed people are baby boomers like me. And I'm not precariously housed, thank God, but um, I think we can expect to see a lot more, a lot more older people on the street. Um, life expectancy on the street goes down dramatically once you get to the street. Life expectancy on the, on the street is in the single digits uh, once you hit your, uh, your 40s, 40s to 50s. So, um, you know, in some ways, I guess, you know, nature will uh, reduce that, that population. But um, it's not really nature, it's the abandonment of uh, people. Okay, go ahead. There, are, uh, there was an article in today's Los Angeles Times on the front page about citizens groups in San Francisco and Venice, neighbor groups, that were fighting homeless shelters being cited in their neighborhood. And they were using the courts to seek environmental reviews and apparently able to keep the matter in the courts for several years over this. And... Um, was said that there was an attempt to deal with that sort of thing about the bullet train and to limit the court proceedings to nine months, but that courts don't have to abide by that, so it was an unenforceable rule. Do you have any suggestions in regard to this? Um, well, I do think there are things that can be done to, um, to expedite environmental review. It's not my specialty. I have colleagues in the law school who could give you a more uh, a more complete answer to this, but um, right now there are so many steps in the environmental review and the deadlines pile up on deadlines. And um, you can stall things long enough uh, for them to go away. For example, when these projects get done, the people that want to do them, uh, they typically have some financing lined up. And if you can just keep that project from breaking ground, um, for a period of time, then that project will go away because the financing will pull out. So um, it it is very challenging, uh, and you know I, some people would use this as an opportunity to say, well, let's get rid of the CEQA and the environmental review. I'm I'm not one of those people. I think you can do something more targeted, but it's sort of beyond my expertise to tell you exactly what that thing would be. But I mean, we've done it before. I mean, we built. That we re rebuilt the Santa Monica Freeway after the earthquake without uh, four years of environmental review because people would have rioted had they done that. Uh, in the um, 1960s, there were a number of uh, housing projects built in large urban cities like the Cabrini Green in Chicago and and uh, San Francisco and another, other major urban areas. And I wonder if you could comment on what mistakes were made because of some of those projects became dens of um, drug sales and, and uh, high crime. Yeah, th those projects were built according to the formula, the most square feet per dollar that you can get. And that turns out to be a cube. The larger the cube, the bigger the return. Uh, and the biggest mistake they made uh, was the same one I discussed earlier. They never asked what a reasonable place would look like to the people who would live in them. They weren't just terrible for the neighborhood. They were terrible for the people who lived in them. They were, they were literally you know, built according to just a couple of criteria. There was nothing livable about them. They weren't on a scale that, uh, that, um, that made any sense. You know, by contrast, um, the, um, what is it, in, on La Brea, you know, that was public housing also. That was very expensive housing at, at the moment. Um, so um, you, you can certainly do it wrong, and, and we did it wrong in the same way that, you know, during that era, they basically just bulldozed their way through neighborhoods and threw in freeways where they didn't belong and all that sort of thing. So um, our forefathers weren't necessarily any smarter than we were. Uh, but we certainly wouldn't do that again. And when, um, yeah, I mean, nobody would do that again. Everybody uses Cabri Cabrini, bring some P Cabrini Green as, um, as a cautionary tale that the government shouldn't do any housing. Well, that's silly. Uh, if you were going to argue that, then there's lots of mistakes the government has made, but we don't pull out of that whole field. Um, we just have to do it smarter. And, and, and again, 
having some responsiveness to the people who are actually going to have to live with the consequences, whether that's the neighbors or the people who are going to be living in the housing. Having been uh, involved in low-income housing in the 80s uh, in a governmental position, it's pretty clear uh, from what you say that government agencies are not able to combat the housing, the homeless problem. Do you think there's a way to stimulate NGOs who seem to be doing a much better job, like the Salvation Army, for example? Um, well, you know, there's a range of NGOs. Some of them work better than others. Um, but they have, you know, a limited resource base. So the Union Rescue Mission, the biggest mission in America, has an annual budget of about $50 million. All in small, almost all of it in small donations, none of it from the government. But with the exception of some well built, uh, you know, well established institutions like that that have an enormous uh, base of, of constituents, um, most NGOs that do this stuff rely on the government for the money. And um, one of the things we're seeing now with uh, this infusion of money is that a lot of those NGOs, they're doing good things. But now, every, no matter what they were doing before, now it's called homeless prevention. And they're just like doing more of it, uh, but it's not really targeting homeless people so, uh, or people likely to become homeless. So um, in some of those agencies, I mean, like eviction defense, that's, that's good. But most people who get evicted don't become homeless. Only some of them are likely to become homeless. You know, the money should homeless. Um, Prevention money should be targeted to those folks. And that's typically not happening, uh, in part because the NGOs have a have an interest in, you know, getting getting money with as few restrictions as possible because they, they have a mission general generally to do whatever it is they do, which is, often includes dealing with homelessness, but goes beyond it. So, um, yeah, I mean, both both could do better, but NGOs don't have the resource base to. Um, you know they're not up to they're not up to this. We couldn't do public education without government money. We can't solve this problem without government money, without public finance at least. Hi, uh, thank you so much. This is very informative, and of course it's tragic. So I, my question is, how do these poor people? get a job when they don't have an address, they don't have a cell phone, even if they want to pull themselves out of it and they have ability, they've worked before, but they can't get a job, what, what happens then? Right, so um, one thing is that there are some programs, not nearly enough, that provide short-term housing subsidies for people who have a chance of getting a job. So even in that miserable general relief system that I talked about, they have a little housing subsidy program that if you're employable and you're recently employed, they'll give you enough money maybe to sleep on somebody's couch while you're looking for work. Um, so improving that capacity a little bit. Um, you know, but it's hard. I mean, the one thing that, that has changed over time is that when I started this, if I wanted to if talk to one of my homeless clients, I had to walk the streets of Skid Row to find him or her. Um, now, actually, a significant number of people have prepaid cell phones because that's their link to the outside world and to whatever resources they have, a family or a friend. So, um, you know, there, there are things could be, that can be done. But if there are people who actually have, you know, reasonable skills, um, you know, there are ways to match them up. And as, as I mentioned before, we're I'm going to be going to a meeting this month of people from everybody, from the Secretary of Labor in California, Julie Su, to the head of the County Federation of Labor, to um, people at Trade Tech who do job training, uh, to address exactly some of these problems and to identify those people who can be helped, uh, who have the, the most likely return on, on the investment of that, that time and money. So that, that can be done. But honestly, um, it's a really terrible labor market if you don't have uh, any, if you have nothing but muscle power, if that's all you've got, there's really no jobs for you. And the jobs that are mostly muscle power uh, are all occupied 
frankly, by, mostly by immigrants uh, who have a lot of skills that they acquired in their home countries who know how to do construction things and so on. If you went to LA Unified and, and lived in the city all your life, there's not a lot of things that you know how to do that the uh, labor market values. A couple more questions. Actually, the last question dovetails nicely with mine, which is when you dig down into where exactly you should be building the, this homeless housing, First of all, there's the question of whether it should be part of sort of an integrated, maybe two um, homeless with supportive services, with middle income and upper income. It seems to me we'll never have enough construction to take care of all the homeless people if we do it that way. But so if we look at just 100% homeless and very low income people, how do you prevent it from becoming an unemployed Cabrini Greens kind of location when you think about, okay, if it's gotta be built along um, a transit corridor, how many transit corridors do we have that actually contain or are nearby employment for our own unemployed homeless people in Los Angeles? Well, I think a lot more than we're taking advantage of. Uh, and, but I, I agree with you. Um, having a, a you know a huge you know 200 unit uh, housing full of recently homeless people, even if it's across the street from the subway station, is probably not a good idea. And a much preferable idea is to take those folks, divide them up, use some uh, ordinary housing stock uh, to which we are adding uh, supply, and have it scattered, you know, more more across uh, more across at least the lower income neighborhoods where that's where it's where it would be more feasible uh, to do. Unfortunately, that for the people already there. But if you do it right, some of this housing will be the best housing in that neighborhood. Um, and uh, there's reasons for landlords to want to um, to cut a deal if somebody would negotiate with them on a deal basis, and that that's how that the um, on the East Coast that's very common. The the city uh, buys floors of, of buildings, and so everybody uses the same elevators and their services, and there's somebody a resident manager for that floor doing the services. So. Um, we have a different housing stock here, but to the degree that we're getting a lot more housing stock like that, I mean, that, that could work. Final question. Well, unfortunately, I have two. <laughs> um, you mentioned Prop 13, and um, so I wonder if the upcoming ballot measure on uh, uh, dual roles will help. It'll help, although it's not clear where the money will go, or at least not clear to me. Uh, I haven't looked at it recently in terms of what it's uh, going to be dedicated to. Um, and there's a lot of demands in Sacramento and a lot of different constituencies often arguing for, you know, health care or mental health care or housing or welfare. And they are, they're all arguing about, arguing for the same people, but they're arguing for their piece of that person. So um, it will certainly be better, better than, than now. And the second question is I have uh, some experience with working with um, foster kids and foster kids aging out of that yeah. system. And uh, would you talk a little bit about that? They have, they have really peculiar, their own s peculiar problems. Uh, one thing I would say is they, um, you were talking about the restraints on particular kinds of housing. They refused to go in anywhere where they had, you know, limitations, uh, uh, hours that they had to be in, hours they had to be out, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, that's true of almost everybody, not just young people. I mean, the idea of a, of a home is actually, um, as long as you don't have a mom or dad telling you something, um, you come and go as you want. Uh, I think that that should be the goal, and um, you know, as to what people are doing when they're out at four o'clock in the morning, that's a separate issue. I mean, just to wrap it up, there's I mean, there's been a lot more done around what's called actually the bureaucrats called them the TAs, which I didn't know what they were talking about. 
That stands for T-A-Y Transition Age Youth. But rather than say that, they call them TIS. So um, there's more resources, uh, but we're still losing that, losing that battle. That number is going up as well. That, that number and the elderly numbers are going up. Thank you very much, Professor Blasey. That was a uh, very informative, and thank you all for coming, and we'll see you in September.